As uh, Dean of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to Schollmeyer Hall and Vall Walker Hall uh, at uh, the Faye Jones School on the campus of the University of Arkansas for the fifth of six presentations by competition finalists uh, who have all prepared proposals for the design, conceptual design, of the Anthony Timberlands Center for Design and Materials Innovation. We're very pleased to welcome uh, not only all of you, uh, but this afternoon, uh, Kennedy and Violich Architecture and team. And I will introduce uh, Kennedy and Violich Architecture in a minute. But as we uh, start, I would like to recommend everyone still their attention to the exhibition of the six finalist proposals currently on view in the Smith Gallery, which will be on view until the middle of March. And in doing so, first I'd like to acknowledge the superb installation, construction and installation of that exhibition uh, led by uh, Charles Sharpless, Justin Tucker, John Bulkins, and uh, Randall Dickinson, Angie Carpenter, uh, and a host of uh, students, all, uh, in fact, many of them reconstructing models that arrived to us uh, somewhat um, worse for the wear of FedEx and DHL. But uh, to, not only to recommend that exhibition, but also with regard to that exhibition, to uh, acknowledge with gratitude uh, the funding of that exhibition by the U.S. Forest Services and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. That's what has allowed us to have this competition uh, construct this exhibition and, in fact, to host our six finalists for their uh, presentations in person to us. None of this would have really, in fact, occurred, however, were it not for the generosity and the vision of Anthony Timberlands and, in particular, uh, John Ed and Isabel Anthony, uh, who saw in the proposal that we made as a school to them uh, that there would be virtue and value in working together to further the interests of Arkansas forests and the interests of the school. Uh, the Anthony's have provided uh, a significant gift to the school in order to make possible the Anthony Timberland Center as a, as a, a facility for the school. That gift has been matched by the university and then further enhanced by uh, funding from Governor Hutchinson uh, in Little Rock, but uh, principally we are indebted uh, to Anthony Timberlands and to Mr. and Mrs. Anthony, and Mr. and Mrs. Anthony join us today down here in front. I'd like to ask for acknowledgement of their generosity to us as a school. Our Chancellor uh, Steinmetz and our Provost, Provost Coleman, as well as Mike Johnson, head of university facilities, have also been uh, uh, important supporters of these initiatives, not only here in the school, but across the University of Arkansas campus. Uh, two years ago, uh, the university designed and constructed, or had designed and constructed, the library uh, annex building, the first mass timber building of any kind in the state of Arkansas, and this past August, as many know, we opened Adobe Hall, <laughs> Adohi Hall, uh, residence halls, uh, 700 beds, 200,000 square feet of mass timber construction, currently the largest such construction in the United States. None of that would, occurred, would have occurred were it not for the leadership of uh, Chancellor Steinmetz. We have then been able to envision the Anthony Timberland Center. And as we move forward in this process, uh, I am leading a building project committee uh, that consists of uh, 10 in total. I'm joined in that committee by John Folan, head and professor of architecture, Carl Matthews, head and professor of interior design, uh, Gabrielle Diaz Montemayor, assistant professor in landscape architecture, uh, John Bulkins, teaching assistant professor, and ultimately the school's representative into the building process, uh, Angela Carpenter, who is the Fabrication Workshop Supervisor for the Faye Jones School. Uh, Jerry Snyder, Professor and Executive Director of the School of Art. And then three members of University Facilities, 
Todd Ferguson, Jay Honeycutt, and Darren Claremont. We have either the enviable or unenviable task of uh, ultimately bringing a recommendation forward for consideration by the Board of Trustees at their March meeting. The uh, competition uh, proposals that you see in the Smith Gallery that you'll see here uh, shortly all relate to what is envisioned as a 50,000 square foot, $16.5 million facility uh, with a fabrication workshop very much at its heart, but that workshop to be surrounded by classroom spaces, studio spaces, auditorium, library, other ancillary spaces. Uh, and so in one form or another, you will see that composition. It's also important to note that all of this is to be situated at the corner of Government Avenue and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard uh, in what is now uh, officially referred to as the Wingate Art and Design District, already occupied by the Sculpture Studio Building and the Library Annex Building, soon to be occupied along with ours uh, with new facilities for the School of Art. And that's all configured for us in the site models in the gallery. So we have an alliance and a partnership and a good neighbor in the School of Art and the university libraries, and that site planning and that attention to landscape is also very much a part of this uh, overall ambition. The larger ambition, of course, is to uh, direct the school toward the interests of the Arkansas forests and the larger ecologies of the region and the nation, and I believe we'll hear something of that uh, in this presentation as we have heard yesterday and for the remainder of today. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, the current presentation at hand provided by Kennedy and Violich Architecture. KVA is a Boston-based interdisciplinary design practice founded in 1990 by principals Sheila Kennedy and Juan Fra <laughs> Frano Violich. Uh, the firm works at the intersection of architecture, sustainable building technologies, and emerging public needs and lifestyles. Central to the work of KVA is the idea that the necessary infrastructure of buildings and cities can be transformed by design to enhance the experience and activities of daily life. Material innovation through MATX, the Material Research Unit of KVA, is also an integral part of their work, engaging material fabrication, digital technologies, and natural resource conservation. KVA has built an extensive body of work, including educational, cultural, residential buildings, as well as urban scale master plans, and they have a significant portfolio in university and campus architecture. Selected works include the Soft House in Hamburg, Germany of 2013, the Totzer Anth Anthropology Building at Harvard University in Cambridge in 2014, and most recently the Wellesley College Global Flora in Wellesley on the campus of Wellesley College just completed last year. Among numerous awards, awards and recognition that the firm has received for their work are AIA National Design Excellence Awards, two Energy Globe Awards, a U.S. Congressional Award. And both uh, Sheila and Frano have been elevated to the American Institute of Architects National College of Fellows. They have brought a significant uh, team with them, and we're very pleased to welcome to this podium and to this school, Kennedy and Violich Architecture. Welcome. Marring Peter's wonderful introduction here, um, but we'll get right back to this. Uh, okay, great. So can you plug us back in? Yeah. All right, go ahead, Fonda. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Peter, uh, for your kind words. Uh, it is a thrill and a privilege for us to be here to share our thoughts on the 
Anthony Timberland's center. There we are. Um, I wanted to, to thank Peter and I thank the selection committee and thank our sponsors for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we've assembled a fantastic team of consultants who have coming or who are coming from all over the place uh, internationally. They are people we've known for a long time, worked with interna internationally. Uh, I would call them friends. We've made new friends as well. So um, I will start with uh, introducing my partner, Sheila. Hi, Prano. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, we're going to try to uh, present to you as a, as a collective team, which is a little bit difficult because uh, this, this uh, podium is set up for, for one person. Um, but before we do that, um, Frano and I and uh, our whole team would like to make a set of acknowledgments. Um, we would really like to thank um, the following individuals and organization for all of their online information, conversation, and really um, inspiration. Um, we've been exposed to a really deep level of expertise here and we're grateful, and we've learned a lot um, from, um, um, from our past two months working on this, on this, uh, on this proposal. Um, the woods, the forest, is, is by definition a kind of a place of polyculture. Um, there are different kinds of plant materials, um, and forests thrive when they're diverse. And so we thought it was really appropriate for the Timberland Center to um, present and to, to work as a kind of collective team. Um, and so, um, as Frano said, we have uh, brought um, a number of our team uh, here uh, to, to present with you today. Uh, Wes Michaels, uh, Thorsten Helbig, uh, Catherine Faulkner, um, and um, we also have Hilary Williams and uh, Eric Olson from Arup and Transolar and my colleague at MIT, Paul Maincourt, um, who are not able to come today. So I'm going to make a very brief introduction of KVA, and then I'll ask uh, my team to also do the same. Um, what's, what's important to kind of think about when you see these numbers, I would just ask you to, to, to think of a couple of things. Um, one, that um, we're productive. Um, we, we love making things. We love making buildings. And um, we, we um, are very much committed to that process of, 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 of creating designs and, and making them real. Um, we are um, involved a lot in university work. Um, and we're also a certified um, minority firm um, in Boston. As Peter mentioned, KVA is really known for material research. Um, and we uh, take our research, it's applied research, and we put it into um, our architecture practice. And then we take um, strands of the practice and feed that back into the research. I just thought I'd share with you a little bit about our culture. Um, we have uh, a large studio with uh, two workshops. There's always activities of making, models, model making is very important. We test, um, we prototype. We have a fairly large rapid prototyping uh, facility uh, in-house, and we use this to actually make components of our project um, and of our work. So um, without um, further ado, I want to turn um, the podium or microphones over to our team, uh, starting uh, with Wes. Hello. I'm Wes Michaels. <laughs> I'm Wes Michaels with Spatman Mossett Michaels. We are landscape architects with offices in New Orleans, Detroit, and Sydney. And at the foundation of our practice is three principles. We really focus on the idea of community, design, and ecology. And our practice started out of working with communities in post-Katrina New Orleans and really trying to get into the idea of open space and how open space works and how it can serve communities. We also really believe in the power of design, and that design matters, and design should be a part of the discussion in any of the things, any of the issues that we're discussing globally, nationally, and all the things that we're facing sort of as a country and as a, as a population. And finally, ecology. At the base of all of this is a, is a strong sense of urban ecology and thinking about cities as, as ecological systems and trying to work within those systems and thinking about those. These, our work really ranges from small scale interventions. This is part of a larger reforestation plan that we did in City Park in New Orleans with reclaimed cypress stumps that came down during Hurricane Gustav to larger 
uh, park projects. This is in Chattanooga with intensive interest in stormwater management, attention to detail, working within civic spaces, and making those civic spaces really work for the community. So I think we're going to try to keep this brief and um, move on uh, to Katie. My name is Katie Faulkner, and um, I am privileged to join the team from a company called Katera. I am the Vice President of Design and Architecture for a tech-driven company that has a mission to change the way buildings are delivered, do it more sustainably, more efficiently, more cost-effectively, and we have a very um, strong investment in mass timber. One of the things that I have found interesting about this particular trip is this is not a group that I need to express or explain a lot in terms of timber, mass timber, and the timber industry, so I'm gonna skip that. Um, what I'm really here for is to be part of the, um, the delivery of the project as well as design assist in talking about ways um, that we can make this project more efficient and really design it for mass timber. Um, one of the things you're seeing here in the photo is Katera has a CLT factory in Spokane Valley, Washington, followed by a glue lamb factory not far behind. So um, our thinking in terms of timber and forestry and construction and design um, really runs very deep to the company. And as I said, it's really great to be part of the team. Um, again, normally I would talk to you through about how it's all made, sort of with the lamb stock, et cetera, but this campus and this region of the company really is sort of ground zero for I think what is be going to become a sea change in the way buildings are delivered and constructed. So um, again, thinking in terms about this building and Anthony Timberlands as a um, not only kind of as a name building with the research that you're doing, but where you may be in sort of um, forward thinking project delivery and how the industry is going to change. Yeah, hello, I'm uh, Thorsten Helbig. I'm not an architect, I'm a structural engineer. Uh, so, uh, and uh, also I kind of live in, we live in, in both worlds. So my origin, as you probably already realized with my accent, I'm a German. Uh, so my, we wor work in both worlds. We work in Europe, also we work here in North America. Uh, since 10 years, in, uh, we are based in New York. Uh, what I find interesting, when I, we just came here, you, I saw your pavilions here, the pavilions built in, here in front of the building. Very, this is really very interesting, and, uh, because I think this development, which we all see now here in North America, is, is really uh, what but also pushes us. You see, we, we work with, as I said, in different worlds, with different materials, but at the moment, I, when, we, when we talk about uh, CL mass timber projects, uh, I always say that, uh, uh, that there was the, the, this is the, um, the 19th century was steel, 20th was concrete, the 21st century will be again a timber century. Uh, so you see, I don't want to talk about this project a lot. Um, I want to talk about uh, maybe our approach. I also teach as a, uh, yeah, teach structures for architects, don't be afraid. And the architectural faculty uh, at Cooper Union, <laughs> they won't be afraid. Uh, uh, at the, uh, and what I find interesting is that the working, I mean, this is the third year undergraduate course I teach, um, uh, that, that, this is the, that the working with uh, the new mass timber or yeah, timber technologies is very easy to understand, it's very easy to access, and uh, we see that uh, our students uh, like a lot. And, and when we do our residential project in the, in the now spring semester, 80% would use uh, timber as a material, and I would always try to uh, push that a bit back because also there's other materials to be look at. Um, yeah, maybe a timber, when as an engineer, this, is, this has many, uh, let's say, you can do a lot with that because it's, it could be massive as in, in mass timber, in CLT, but it could be very filigree. So we explored this uh, in many projects, you know, Stuttgart, where I, my roots are, Frei Otto, and this history of lightweight structures. So we, we made use of the, try to make use of, of the elasticity and uh, uh, yeah, these kind of more um, yeah, uh, high performance aspect of, of timber because timber can be very strong. Uh, and can um, very much uh, or very well uh, used in, in very efficient structures, lightweight structures. And by doing that, we supported, we worked for, for this project as well for, client, for the client, but also for the, on the contractor side, because I think to understand technology is very important, and that's also what I 
the important behind the, the buildings, behind the construction is very important, and that's also what I try to discuss with, with the students. Um, and then my colleague, Paul Maincourt, um, who is a structural uh, engineer and architect from Switzerland. Um, and Paul has been working with Whole Trees Company, a company in um, Wisconsin. Uh, Paul is, is all things hands-on. Um, he's a fantastic uh, teacher and engineer. And basically his work with Whole Trees um, has been at the kind of cutting edge of taking large um, whole uh, branching irregular uh, pieces of tree, um, scanning them and being able to then understand the natural uh, variations and irregularities and understand uh, analytically the, the structural capabilities um, that these, these pieces might offer. So we have um, a, a number of things that we'd like to share with you and we'd kind of like to kind of uh, um, take you behind the scenes and, and talk a little bit about some of the thinking um, in our proposal uh, and some of the things that, that we considered. Um, you know, when you, when you do a competition, um, uh, you, 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 have, you have certain instincts, certain things that you can't um, really explain. And um, right off the bat, after reading the RFP, um, we knew that we really wanted to find a way to kind of connect to the state of Arkansas and to the forests of Arkansas. Um, this was important not only because of the new uh, plant that's uh, happening in Conway, um, but because of the diversity of trees uh, in the forests um, around uh, Fayetteville and the fact that um, the CLT industry here in the state could be a major kind of, um, a major uh, positive benefit for the economy. Um, so we wanted to make uh, the architecture uh, really relate to the forests of Arkansas, to be substantially sourced from the forests of Arkansas, and to be U.S. sourced. So that would mean for the school it would be the first time that a uh, CLT uh, mass timber building would be sourced from the United States. And we did a little bit of research um, and we found out um, that one forest management practice that occurs widely in the state, it occurs in different ways, is uh, thinning, the removal of smaller diameter trees so that the other trees in the forest can grow and can have higher value. Um, and um, since the um, uh, th when the thinning process occurs, um, since there is no use per se for these small irregular pieces of wood, they tend to be discarded, left to rot, or just burned. Sometimes they're, they're put into wood pellets, but it's really a one-time source. And given that the forestry industry in Arkansas is, is about a, a $6.4 billion industry, those thinnings that are kind of left behind um, are like leaving, you know, um, a, a $64 million on the ground. Like if, if I left $64 million on the ground, I'd be concerned about that. So we, we literally want to take every last piece and find a way to add that to, to the forestry economy. So this was part of our kind of motivation um, behind uh, our project. Um, this, this sort of central um, question then, I think, with this, um, this uh, challenge of the competition is connection, connection at across, uh, across a variety of scales. And you know, at the, at the scale of the city, um, it's, it's how can um, a, a work of architecture and the design of a creative uh, precinct um, help catalyze the elements that are there, um, the Frisco Trail, the new park by the library, um, the connections between the mill district, um, the new creative uh, precinct that we're imagining um, with the sculpture and art buildings, and then back here to the campus. You know, how can that unfold? Um, so um, in, in, in looking back at the history of the site, we realized that this site where we're asked to work um, is a site where actually the urban and the industrial intersect. It's a very unique site in that we see present two forces, two kind of drivers, the urban grid of Fayetteville and then the geometry of the uh, rail line that, that comes in. And we started digging around some of the uh, Sanborn maps and discovered, um, you know, in, in, interestingly, um, that this site was always involved with wood and wood production. Um, before there was this hardwood post company in the 1940s, there was a uh, oak barrel stave um, production company. And it's natural that all of these wood industrial um, uh, production uh, sites 
uh, fronted onto the rail railway yards and were part of the railway yard geometry. Um, so as we began to consider the site, we started to think about how we could connect to that history and how we could both connect and isolate. And I say isolate uh, in, a, in a completely non-pejorative way because um, when you have uh, a significant workshop with the kinds of tools and aspirations for manufacturing um, that the Timberland Center has, um, vibrations, noise, dust, um, there are a number of different elements that are just not, not conducive to having classrooms and having labs uh, be atop them because of vibrations and other things. So we, we sighted um, the mass of a, of a seven-story tower uh, at this kind of urban corner um, facing north and east that would be visible um, from Government Street, uh, from the trail, um, also from the shuttle stop. And then we uh, conceived of lower um, two-story pavilions for the auditorium uh, right here. And then we uh, conceived of the workshop as a series of three similar pavilions that would be subdivided by uh, skylight zones. And so our, um, our, our urban precinct follows a very simple geometry that reflects the industrial history with the industrial workshop program and the city's urban grid with the gallery, um, the public areas, the auditorium, um, and the tower. And uh, Wes will, will speak a little bit more about the, uh, the landscape design. Thank you, Sheila. So when we start a project, we like to look really big. We go out in a very big scale. And so we're starting to think about bigger connections, not only to the site, which we'll look at in a minute, but to even the larger sort of ecological patterns that are happening across even uh, continents. So this is the monarch butterfly uh, breeding pathway, their migration path. We know the Mississippi flyway is a huge thing. There's over 200 species of birds that fly through and nest, some large waterfowl type birds, but smaller birds that nest in our urban forests and the urban uh, landscape. So we want to think about, you know, big picture ideas and how these systems start to tie into our landscape. As we go down in scale, we also want to think about Arkansas and the natural landscapes of Arkansas and how these landscapes start to relate to this site. So we're thinking about how can we start to bring some of the idea of the forest into the site, both through a narrative in a way to say like how do we start to bring this in from a conceptual standpoint and the meaning of materials how we start to develop the site but also through the use of native plants the use of the landscape and starting to understand how to replicate some of these ecological systems that are existing in the in the wider landscape on the site itself so this is looking at a first pass at a ground plane plan here one of the things that we were really interested in along with the explorations that Sheila and her team did, was thinking about how do we start to navigate the topography of the site. Now, in plan, it looks very flat, but when you're out on the site, there's quite a bit of a, of a topographical change between MLK and down at the bottom where the sculpture building is. And so one of the things we looked at is how can we make this accessible? How can we make this feel like a quad? So in some ways, what we're looking at is trying to replicate a typology of campus quad and thinking about the different types of campus quads we have and creating spaces for not only movement between buildings, but also for places for people to rest, to relax, to hang out, to meet with their friends. The second decision we made that's evident in this diagram is thinking about how we navigate the site. So there's one system that goes from the top of the hill straight down the hill, and you're facing down the hill a series of steps and terraces, and we explored that. But as we started to look at that, what we thought might be more interesting is the idea of reorienting people's path of movement back and forth between the quads. So as you see here, there's movement from the art building into the new Timberlands architecture building and into the, into the uh, auditorium, into a potentially a sculpture yard that's in that sort of U-shaped uh, area of the new art building, that party and starting to think about this cross movement back and forth so that the energy of the site starts to move between the buildings back and forth on these series of terraces. These terraces are also very shallow. You know, we work very hard to think about the topography so they're all less than 5%. They're all accessible as you move back and forth across the building. Um, and even all the way down to that road, to the service access road. So what we were really 
thinking there is how does the service access road not only bring trucks in, have different cars and vehicles that need to operate there, but how can it also be a social space? How can this space start to integrate itself into the plaza? So if you see sort of at the bottom, the bottom of the hill is, is, is down where the bar of the buildings are, that is the service road. And so that service road starts to seamlessly blend into these series of ramps and terraces that go up, connect the buildings across the site, up to the top, and end up at MLK. Um, the second thing we're thinking about is within this, is back to that typology of the quad. And we think about quads often as these places that, lots of different typologies, but some of them have green space with trees. We're also interested in, in like I, we were talking about before, bringing some of the forest, the essence of the forest, into this landscape. So if we think about classic quads, even the quad that we have here, the front quad at the University of Arkansas, there's green spaces for people to hang out, there's cross movement, there's a canopy and ground plane. And so we're starting to try to develop what becomes a quad that is not only uh, a place for people to hang out, it's a place that mimics the forest, but it's also an experimental art and design workspace itself. So the work that's going on inside the buildings can bleed out into this quad, sculpture gardens, work that's happening down at the, uh, the workshop can bleed out into the street and bleed out into this landscape. So it's really blurring those lines between interior and exterior and bringing some of those, in, those spaces out into the landscape. And as I mentioned early on, part of the sort of the DNA of our practice is, is stormwater management and ecology. So what our goal for this project is to have the water that comes onto this site be cleaner when it leaves the site than when it hit the ground. And we work a lot with exposing these natural systems in bioswales, bioretentions, rain gardens, but also really concentrating on the health and the life of the soils themselves. This is sort of like the microbiome of a landscape in a way, is this idea of healthy soils and how they contribute to both carbon sequestration, but also how they contribute to urban heat island mitigation and a host of other ideas. And, and a lot of it is in the foundation of the soils um, in the landscape. This is just a plan to start to show how some of these spaces work together. It's a series of ramps and level spaces. There's opportunities to really inhabit these spaces. Right now, this is really a partee diagram because we're at the beginning of a design process. But there's a way to enrich this and add layers into this and, and really human scale spaces that start to develop and come out and emerge from this, this larger structure of this ramping and terrace system that, that starts to connect the buildings internally. From an ecological standpoint, this is work that we did at Couturier Forest in a forest restoration project we did over um, about eight or ten years, um, thinking about the landscape not only as a flat ground plane, but the way nature sees landscapes in three dimensions, vertically. So a lot of what happens in a landscape happens not only moving horizontally on the ground plane, but birds and insects and butterflies and different types of um, species move vertically through a structured layered forest. And so what we want is where we have the vegetation, where we start to populate this landscape with, with the native plants of Arkansas to think about how we start to build that layered ecosystem um, into the landscape itself, all the way down to the soil, the water, and how those connect into the buildings. And you can see here, this is a model that we created um, to look at this, is that that same system potentially starts to pull itself out across the site into across the Tanglewood branch, you know, over, you know, towards the South Yard development, but also potentially in the other direction where we start to start to link some of these larger urban forest spaces through this site. So this site becomes a way to link some of the other ecological uh, spaces that are that are present in the city. And finally, for us is if we think about the human scale and some of this idea of what it feels like and what it means to be in a forest. I talked about this idea of a hybrid quad, forest, academic quad, experimental workspace, experimental art space, but also the experience of being in a forest. What is it like to look up? What about the light that comes through these trees? You know, that as you're walking through the forest, that view up into the canopy becomes something really magical as well as the view of the ground plane and how the ground plane starts to operate, what that feels like. And those are the types of design decisions we'll start to dig into as we start to develop the, the project. Another aspect of being in the forest is attention to detail. Finding moments where you can stop and look at things up close, look at plants, look at flowers, look at different details, you know, and, and really touch them. So how we access those plants and how those, potentially those rain gardens and bioswales start to be accessible to people is, is another part of the decision making process in the design 
And finally, can we make this a pollinator habitat? Can we start to make sure this, the ecology of this space serves those larger missions of you know, making, this, making Arkansas you know, one of the most amazing natural places in the country? Sheila? Thanks, Wes. So you're probably familiar with uh, Charles and Ray Eames' film, Times 10. We're zooming in closer and closer, and now I'm going to take us inside the building. We're going to talk a little bit about pro program. What is program? Program is one of those sort of neutral words you really wonder what it means. And it's really the daily life and the activities that take place that make a place feel comfortable, make a place feel productive, or you might feel creative. It creates experience. But this program is very unusual in that it's not just people in place, it's, it's people and tools, big tools, gantry cranes in this space. So how, how we can begin, begin to bring what Wes was talking about, bring that kind of fascination of nature side by side with a program that has to do with making. Now the KVA, Sheila and I have been doing shop spaces and fabrication spaces for quite a long time. And it's been getting more and more exciting because people are really interested in making. More higher education institutions, more students are interested in making. So this, this particular place, though, uh, at the Anthony Timberlands is different. The machines are impressive. Uh, this is not just a maker space. So we have to be very conscious about the equipment that's being used. We'd like to talk to as many of the faculty and students about what the challenges are, what the needs are from not only equipment, but also from storage, material, material handling, uh, air quality, dust collection. There's so many things that come into play uh, into a program like this. And so what we do in the end is develop a whole list of, of these needs and, and try to really follow them as much as possible as we can throughout the, uh, the, the project. So what's, what's critical in, a, in, a, in a, a place like this is to be able to start to outline and structure a, 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 a logic in terms of working. But that logic in terms of working has to work over a building that's going to be here 20, 20, 30, 40, 50, could be here 100 years. It has to be super flexible. So what we tried to do is provide as many opportunities for things like material handling, delivery of materials. You can see here, that's a 40-foot 40, 40 container truck that can then pull in. It can pull in to the west in the yard. It can pull to the off of Government Ave where we have a gantry crane that runs from uh, east to west. It can also pull in along the southern face, uh, which has a canopy uh, overhead. Then when you get into the equipment, it gets really exciting because, first of all, we were given certain equipment. We were, took the liberty of actually adding some equipment. For example, down here on the bottom left, you can see we have a, 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 glue, a CLT glue press that we felt was a little bit small for what you might be able to do. So we, we thought there, it would be great to be able to do larger panels, uh, panels that could provide, for, for, for example, lifts, uh, panels that you could lift for housing, uh, for doing small, small, even small little units. Or this is really pushing the limit here, uh, thinking about turbine, uh, turbine blades. This is just this, the fantastic amount of things that you can do. And this gantry is key in a place like this because it's got to be able to lift objects over all the other equipment, all the other equipment that also has connections to power and to dust, uh, dust collection. So there's a kind of uh, interesting hands-on relationship between materials that will always, has always been around and will always be there, even if we, even if, uh, we begin software changes or um, or even a software goes away. It will always be there, this idea of being connected to the tool and craft. I'm going to let Sheila take us inside the building to go through the plans. Um, so um, there is uh, something that's, um, that's nice about the ability to do your work and to be close to your environment, to just put it, look out the window, something which really doesn't happen in the, in the shop, the temporary shop space today. And so, um, as we were thinking about the, the shop, um, we, we were um, 
thinking about that energy that Wes described of bringing into um, this space living trees. Um, so uh, our, our workshop is conceived of as, as three pavilions with skylights. And that allows us, because they're waffle slabs, which Thorsten will speak about in a minute, it allows us to really open up uh, one of the walls to um, that garden, to that forest grove that you see there. And the kind of feeling of being in a forest could extend into the workshop where people are actually uh, working with wood. And you'd be able to look across this, um, look across this and see um, uh, beyond, um, let's see if this is working, uh, yeah. See beyond here into the auditorium um, across this uh, across this space. So we're trying to make the shop super functional, but also elevate it to be a very unique experience about um, a daily contact with living trees. And you can kind of see that in this plan view of our of our one uh, sixteenth model of the skylights, the three pavilions, and the way that trees would begin to come into that space. Um, on the second floor. Um, the uh, auditorium begins to kind of work its way down. Um, we have the upper part here of the, um, of the uh, wood library. And we have this figure that you see here. Uh, if you look in the model, you'll see it a little bit better. Um, a figure which overlooks uh, the shop and, of course, the experience of being in this auditorium where here, if you're, I don't know if this has ever happened to any of the students, that you might get a little bit um, distracted during a lecture. Um, but if that's ever the case, you have only to kind of glance off and be re-inspired by those trees and by what your peers are doing in the workshop so that we're really kind of constructing visual, strong visual connections between these. Um, for some time, and you can see in the ceiling, uh, for some time now at KVA, we've been exploring kind of excavating for certified plywood for acoustics and other patterning. We simply program the router to dig into the plywood and to reveal the different laminations, the boats, the structural boats, um, the joints, and, and it produces a kind of painterly effect. And together with other um, uh, explorations that we're doing with projects, we'd like to kind of develop a specific kind of interior for the project. Um, I mentioned the um, overlook um, that one would be able to come in off MLK and, and section the cut here and rise up here in the wood library and begin to kind of overlook and then continue back up on the third floor um, where the third floor connects both with the roofscape on top of the wood shop and the roofscape on top of the auditorium. So here's a, um, our imagined view of what this is like to kind of have a, a, a ramp that extends from uh, the shop right along Government Street. You can see a forklift here. You can drive right from the um, uh, uh, shop into this uh, public lobby. And we're thinking about this as a very active place where uh, all things wood can be exhibited and where making can, um, can occur. And, and kind of thinking about how uh, maybe just very simple pieces of wood could serve as um, as uh, moving carts, emissaries as we call them, that would be able to move all around and display things. So you would rise up these steps um, or take the freight elevator and find yourself here in section um, where the orange lines are overlooking um, the shop space. Um, just a word about the third floor. That's an important floor for us. Um, we have the connections then from the tower to the roofscape, and here, for example, the ability to bring and construct um, large uh, wood um, uh, products out here, small houses, housing units. And then over here, we're imagining, this is south facing, and we're imagining a passive greenhouse could be an addition to the program. Um, at very little cost, it would heat itself, and you could actually grow and study plants in the adjacent bio labs, study cellulose, um, and really get into the biology of trees, as well as be in the tree production business, um, which might be an interesting thing um, in the near future um, when tree planting becomes much more common in the state and when maybe it could be a line of profitability for tax credits around carbon. We've also done a similar all-passive greenhouse recently, and it's kind of an amazing place to be on a cold day like this. Um, this is a living building challenge uh, building, so it's um, entirely a uh, passive greenhouse. And so we're imagining that that greenhouse could be tucked up here. Uh, you, see, you see that here. Here are the saplings that could begin to move out on top of this roof. 
And so the whole south facade is much more experimental. Um, it's a bit like a backyard. It's like Avar Alto's um, summer house where he took all sorts of different materials and would put them outside and study them and be able to change them and learn about them. The upper floors are grouped in um, suites of two. And I think these plans are very diagrammatic, but what the orange blocks show us is that the floor plate of this compact tower is super efficient. It's super simple. Um, all of the infrastructure is in the right place. The core is in the right place. And we use the area in between the urban and industrial grid as a kind of a hinge point for social spaces, which are not in your program, but we feel those kinds of spaces really do need to be in a program because anybody who's working in a lab knows the value of having a community, of being able to bring research together, get serendipity going between different kinds of classrooms and labs, and even have the possibility of two-story communications without atria, without all of the um, uh, requirements uh, of, uh, that atrium conditions produce. So I'm going to conclude really talking about the major um, urban um, uh, gesture uh, that we want to make. And here we want to combine um, glue, glue lamb uh, stepped columns with whole wood, with wild wood. This will be the first time in the United States states that uh, such a, um, a hybrid structure is proposed and hopefully realized. And we wanted very much to put wood on display and not just the industrially proce processed CLT, which is extruded, or the columns, but to taper the columns to the load. And as the load uh, moves up in the building, let the columns step smaller and let the wood take on its diversity of natural forms. So really put wood front and center. And so it's one thing to kind of uh, render this you know, on computer, uh, but it's another thing to build a model of it. Um, but in our office, we really thought that that was essential. And so using uh, Paul's process uh, in, in a kind of a analog manner, uh, we started examining different kinds of vectors, different degrees of density, and imagining how as you go up in this, in this tower, um, there could be better and better visibility as both the um, structure and the wood gets lighter and lighter. Uh, so this actually gave rise to some intense gardening uh, in our studio. Uh, gardening, winter gardening activities that unfolded uh, very quickly. And we actually went in miniature through the process um, that uh, we would really go through if we were realizing this. Finding sticks, characterizing them, this time by analog, uh, by their size and scale. And then even uh, looking at connectors here uh, that could work to hold them. And building the facade model that's uh, in, the, in the Smith Gallery that you can look at that, that, that describes this kind of um, beauty, the, uh, pairing, juxtaposing the kind of natural uh, variation and beauty of whole wood um, with this uh, very beautiful stepped optimized structure. And we were very interested in seeing whether a single detail uh, could accommodate all of that complexity so we don't have to make custom details for every individual piece of wood. So just taking a look at what that might be like on the inside, on the upper floor where we're imagining there could be scholars um, or residents looking out over the city, looking back um, to the historic uh, parts of Fayetteville and even with views to the campus. So I'll turn this over to Thorsten now who will tell us whether this is possible. <laughs> I try to explain, thank you, Sheila. Um, yeah, what, I, what we found interesting uh, when we are talked about the project and we talk about where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm from a south, in, uh, from a s uh, state uh, in Germany, southwest, and we are proud that we have 40% is covered by forest, but you can easily beat us with 56%. Uh, but what we figured in our state, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the use of wood in the moment we have an initiative in our state that uh, the, the government wants uh, every public building which gets built now it needs to be checked whether it can be done in wood, which is an interesting initiative. Uh, and we find that interesting and it kind of pushed us. So for us, um, uh, the idea of using uh, whole timber 
as, as structural components is very interesting. It's not so new, we talked about this, because 100 years ago, the first railway bridges were made out of whole timber. You can see pictures from the 1920s, Cedar Bridge is it called. It's a huge, interesting, impressive structure, and they, they use uh, whole wood as a structural, primary structural component. What do we do with that? Um, uh, give this, there's a mic, right? Um, so I have to go to this picture. What, from a structural standpoint, I don't want to go into the details too much, but this is a seven-story building, a mid-rise building. It needs a lateral bracing. It needs like a big cantilever, and it needs to withstand wind forces. That means you need to use the core. The core, the core is doing this job. It withstands these horizontal forces. Ah, thank you. I need. It's not not sure. Okay. Sorry, I need to move a bit, otherwise. Uh, so this is the core, and the core uh, ideally, structurally, would sit in the middle. But that doesn't really does the job for our project. So the, 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 the core is uh, 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 set to the, to, the, to the outer corner, which makes an open space and accessible from all three, or open to all three uh, sides. So the lateral forces, the main load still goes into this main core, but now we can use this uh, lateral bracing uh, at the edges of the of the slabs as a uh, support for the for the main core. What it does, it uh, uh, you can say it shares responsibility because uh, this core takes the takes the main load, but it's the outer let's say uh, bracing here. It uh, helps to prevent uh, twisting. When you look in plan, you can imagine if, if your support is eccentric, that tends to would tend to twist, to turn. And you see, we engineers we love triangles because they do this job of bracing things. Uh, and you see, we create with this uh, uh, triangulated pattern to uh, realize this uh, uh, lateral bracing. Uh, we developed um, a node system which is easy to understand. We have the vertical loads, they will go through the columns, and as Sheila already mentioned, the columns will react to the load, so every floor from top to bottom, on every floor, the load is, there's a certain amount of load added, that means the, uh, the columns in the seventh floor are pretty small, but in the ground floor are getting bigger and bigger. And what we do is, we develop a system that we can for this uh, whole whole timber uh, bracing components we can set apart because of the ability of CLT to uh, transfer shear forces. This is new. This is an, uh, an, another quality for engineers because glue lamb, they can just transport bending and uh, normal forces, also bending moments and normal forces. But shear force in the plane of this slab, this is just possible now with uh, CLT. That, might, that means we can just set us apart and uh, locate all those connections at the end at the, edge of the uh, slab. And as Sheila mentioned, with this easy connection, you can allow for different angles. You don't have to customize each, uh, each of those connections, uh, but you can really allow for different angles. Um, we thought then further, mm, that was an interesting discussion I had with my young colleagues in the office. Uh, um, we thought, why is this an advantage? I mean, we understand this is like, an, uh, we always, always talk about engineered timber. But in this case, we unengineer timber. We use the simplest uh, form of timber. But also, I've, I, I had something in mind, and I had to go back to my books 25 years ago when I studied structural engineering. Uh, in the fine print of our code, you can find that if you don't uh, touch, let's say, the, the original tree, you can allow for 20% higher stresses uh, for the tree. So it's really because you do not cut uh, the fiber, and that means the, the in structural integrity you can count as count on is 20% higher than for any cut section. You can see this comparison. Um, that is interesting and long forgotten, I think, and not used at the moment. So it's really an efficient uh, approach. Uh, what we also think might be interesting to further development: uh, timber um, transfers forces parallel to the fiber. And to, let's say, we engineers need to take out those forces from a member, transfer it to another component. And to do that, you should do it in the same way. That means you should take out the fiber, parallel uh, forces parallel to the fiber. And that's why we recommend to glue in parallel to the fiber, like uh, threaded rods, which can take out the force and can transfer to the node. There is already uh, um, a 
code base for that that can be made, and we have done it several times. I think that's a very interesting uh, approach. I said this is what it shows. There's different uh, uh, already products in, in Europe available for different uh, other applications, but I think for, for this application, it's really worth to think about that. Um, now the waffle slabs. The, uh, the waffle slabs, uh, here you see, I don't know whether this is so clear for me, it's clear. This, is, <laughs> this is shows the stress distribution, so that means this is our structural system. It's supported just on these four points. This, you have to imagine this is the columns underneath, uh, and what you see here, for sure you can imagine, on top of the columns there's the highest stress, is the highest spending moment. So we will react with that, with the shape of these, uh, of these waffle slabs. That means where we have the highest stresses, we go up, we react with the height of the, of the members. Uh, and we have kind of um, um, optimized already the geometry, because uh, the, uh, we have Two, just two different structures. This is auditorium structure, and you have then three times the same structure to create the workshop. That means all those, uh, each of the, these components are similar and identical, uh, and they are just separated by, these, uh, by, the, by the gap. Okay. You need that? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, just very briefly, because um, this is a school and we want to be responsible. Um, as, as educators and as practitioners. Uh, just a few words about project management. Um, I think the fir most important point here is that, um, that uh, a good concept, um, a good project concept is one that can be realized pragmatically. Um, and so, as I think we're trying to, to show you, we have a really an integrated team process. And there are a number of different points that we'd like to kind of touch on. Um, that will help um, the KVA team manage this, this process. Um, we'll have uh, early interactions with the construction manager and also with the timber manufacturer uh, collaborators. Um, we want to absolutely maximize um, the prefabrication in the glue lamb, so let that be as repetitive and prefabricated as possible and allow the natural wood to be its natural variation. So we'll use biology for, for variation and manufacturing for repetition. And we, as Thorsten uh, really so eloquently pointed out, we're trying to optimize um, the glue lamb um, and the CLT. And so we'll use stepped glue lambs. This is my moment when hopefully I don't knock out the mic. Um, but we're just experimenting with um, found space and just doing everything that we can to take that profile and, uh, and get space for free, space that we can use for ducting that will be below the gantry train. And instead of extruding a glue lamb beam as is common or shaping it and then throwing the waste away, really aim for an almost no waste process where these glue lamps can be set up and because they step, there's very little waste involved, which is also ecologically a, a fundamentally a good thing. Um, and then on a similar scale project, um, complex project that we're doing um, for a library at MIT, um, uh, just thought it would be interesting to share with the students um, this is the schedule that, as an architect, you know you're responsible for. Um, you need to know where we are in the schedule, when we're going to be done, and how, um, how it's all going to unfold. So there's this schedule, which is important to abide by, but the KVA team is also agile because this is really what that schedule looks like. It's much more nonlinear. There are many decisions that need to be made. Um, so we have to toggle between actually understanding a schedule and being responsible about managing um, the many different um, components of this. And so um, to kind of further the idea of optimization, um, I'll turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Sheila. Um, as you all know, it's a really exciting time to be working with timber in construction, design, engineering. Building codes are changing, so with IBC 2021, as more states actually adopt it, there are more opportunities for timber buildings with different construction types that we haven't had before. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about briefly, in addition to um, all the myriad of other things that you have to think about when you're programming this building, you will begin to think about how it's being procured, where's the mass timber coming from, and one of the things that is um, dynamic right now is that the market is changing so fast. 
This is by no means an exhaustive map of all of the people who manufacture CLT, and it doesn't even begin to touch the people that are doing glue lamb, but you can begin to see that in the Pacific Northwest and in the Southeast, there really is kind of critical areas for where timber industry and forestry are overlapping, and I think that's what makes this so exciting. So it is, however, important to understand that each one of these players has their own equipment and they have their own metrics. So as you're beginning to think about the building, we were talking about the exercise of the anatomy of the structural bay. I will not, as I said, explain to this group how CLT is made and the lamb stock, et cetera, and how it all goes together. There definitely is the ability for customization, but there are important discussions and conversations that are happening in terms of available species, where's the timber coming from, who's actually fabricating it. We do have a factory in Spokane Valley, which I invite any of you to visit. We run tours there, and we're going to talk a little bit more about engagement. But we have a number of partnerships with various universities where we're doing some research, and um, the factory is a very exciting place to see that. Our particular billet is our particular billet. So you work with Katera, this may be the module that you're working with. You work with someone else, and they will have a machine that produces something different in terms of length and width. Ours is 60 feet by 11 foot 9. And why that's important is that you really do want to try to minimize waste. That this has the ability not only to change construction in terms of efficiency, but it's just much more sustainable in terms of thinking how the product comes out and how to maximize both the structural strength and then the amount of material that you get from the manufacturing process. So if I just were going to lay something out on a white piece of paper, I would look for a multiple of 60 feet in terms of my structural spacing. I would look for my, C uh, my CNC prep so that I would be pre-drilling for my ducts, for my sprinklers, for my electrical. And then again, I would potentially be looking for my glue lamp spacing to happen within my demising walls so that everything would sort of be tidy and code compliant. This then represents an idealized condition by no means yours. This is a 15-foot bay, works really well with uh, the 60 feet. Another thing you have to think about is the truck that's actually delivering this. So how long can the sheet be? All of these conversations really should happen during design in the very beginning. You don't want to back into these things. You want to use the resources that you have to produce a really efficient building and, again, maximize the power of the timber. When all the billets come together, they are spline joined, so then you get a diaphragm on, to, on top of the, your slab. It is very common to see an exposed timber ceiling in a mass timber building. It's one of the beauties of working with it. It is very uncommon, however, to have the exposed floor. The reasons for that being that there really are some issues with vibration control, et cetera. And so we will uh, generally, after the spline is joined, put some kind of acoustic material in between and then a topping slab on top of that so that you will have um, vibration and noise control that won't transfer floor to floor. We are also in the process of constructing a glue lamp factory. And I show you this not to sell you some glue lamp because it's actually very more likely that your material will come more closer to home, but to think about in terms of what glue lamp factories do. And we have historically looked to other countries for this. Um, and you'll see in the map I showed earlier, a lot of the timber that has been produced in the recent years for mass timber construction has actually come from Europe. Um, that is less true potentially for the glue lamb, um, and as time is going on, will become increasingly less true here. Um, but we have kind of visited best in best practices because optimizing glue lamb. There's tremendous things you can do with glue lamb in terms of bending it, shaping it for the forces, and I imagine that's the very kind of research that's going to happen in this building when this building is finished. Thinking again, I mentioned in terms of engagement, we have a number of strategic partnerships with Washington State University and University of Washington around uh, sequestered carbon, around uh, testing this timber in terms of fire performance. Not every state has signed on for IBC 2021, so sometimes we need to demonstrate alternative means and methods. Sometimes we have to do specialized testing. We will often do that with student groups. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Sheila. All, yes. all of them. All of them. Yes. Um, I think we're just going to end with a flurry of ideas for engagement, so if we can just all um, kind of come up. Um, the idea is to, um, throughout the entire um, design and even construction process, um, 
uh, work with uh, Faye Jones School and work with the university around a number of initiatives and activities that each of our team um, would uh, would produce and provide, and we're just going to go through those very quickly. And um, there were, there won't be a sign up sheet, you know, in the back, um, but just let us know if you're interested. Well, we were thinking about some different ideas for how to engage potentially the landscape architecture students or architecture students or other groups from other uh, schools. But one of the things is thinking about, in the way that Sheila was talking about, salvaging some of the wood is potentially in some of these forests and, and that are being harvested to potentially go out and actually harvest the trees that have a unique shape, that have a unique character, that start to really actually come from the forest and use them in the landscape planting in, in these areas that are starting to be uh, where the wood is coming from, some of the trees can come as well. A really interesting opportunity to bring that narrative in and, and really have a history to the materials and make the materials really start to speak, uh, uh, have a connection between the forests and the site. Um, this is uh, Paul. Yes. Uh, Paul Maincourt wants to work with all of you going to um, local nearby forests and beginning to uh, build skills around scanning trees and creating databases for you to work with for your projects, which could be smaller in scale, um, so that the whole wood is accessible to the school. Um, Frano and I would really like to work with you on a host of different kinds of things from building um, portions of this building, building exhibits, to maybe thinking about wood infrastructure in a future, a kind of a, a green, uh, a, 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 a green and brown, a green and wood um, uh, infrastructure um, similar to what we've done. Yeah, and I was, I'm interested in, I'm an engineer, uh, I'm interested in bridges. Uh, so in a set, uh, 100 years ago and like until 30 years ago, timber bridges were still popular, but a kind of uh, is a problem with them because uh, government and organizations think they are not durable. So, and they often have an issue where they are supported on the bearing. And then we thought, okay, then we don't do a bearing. We do bridges without bearing. That means we directly connect the foundation uh, with, the, uh, with the timber body. What I think is interesting is that we approach it uh, differently in a way, but just not uh, developing totally new, uh, totally new technologies, but using existing ones, but combining the new. What we also do, and I think that's interesting maybe to think about here for the students, we control with, this is the app showing here, this is controlling the moisture content. We have sensors built in, so we can control in our infrastructure, uh, let's say the state uh, of, of, yeah, how, how the structure is behaving and how, how it's developing. That's very important, especially for timber bridges. So I think uh, as, Everywhere, also in Germany, infrastructure is an issue uh, and nobody really takes care of, but it needs to be improved. Uh, and what I said, that's, a, that's a, a contribution to that. So you see just the example, we do more or less, we, we want to do rebars, we really drill them and glue them into the timber body. It's, 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 kind, it's really a new thing. Uh, and we did testing at this, this here at Stuttgart University, structural testing of how that behaves. And you see, we did a, uh, there were three theses uh, dealing with this, uh, whether a bridge without a bearing, how that works. It's, a, this, it's called an integral bridge because it also the soil reacts to that and you have to take that into account. Uh, and we, yeah, I said, I like these pictures. <laughs> Uh, so I see here that this, how the stress is distributed and what we then did with that, we used that stress figure also or this, this, uh, uh, this diagram, to, diagram to create the shape of the bridge. What I like with that is that here structure and architecture comes together and the, 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 the structure or structural principi principles create a new kind of uh, bridge architecture. And here you see this, it's really built three, five times already. four feet into the timber body and only these, these rebars transfer all the forces from the timber into the concrete foundation. So that's how it's built, you know, and I could explain you more about the structural diagram. I will not, <laughs> uh, but you can imagine. So, and then it's very easy because you prefabricate the whole bridge. It's uh, 90 feet long, 90 to 100 feet. I always have to translate from meter into... You can span the creek. You can, uh, yeah, that's... that's that's what I want to do. Uh, the Tanglewood Creek needs bridges. So, uh, the, and then you easily can bring that there. So what I think is interesting with that, uh, uh, so also taking into account the idea of the whole tree structures, uh, and could you bring that back? Like I mentioned, there were bridges built 100 years ago already, railway bridges out of this material. Uh, how could we maybe translate that into at least pedestrian bridges? Uh, the Tanglewood Creek needs bridges.
think that is uh, it. Um, we're, um, yes, we're, we're into the woods. We're into the diversity of the Arkansas woods. Um, thank you, and we'd be glad to try to field your questions. Thank you. So again, I'd like to invite uh, questions. We've got about uh, t uh, 15, 20 minutes here, so please. Yes. Hello, I'm Miller. You guys met me before, but I'm fifth year architecture. Um, I just had a question about the uh, whole wood. I found that really intriguing and very interesting as a concept. Um, and from the design you've proposed, there's supposed to be these very like macro structures that um, are kind of a facade. I was just wondering if you could speak to the idea of that becoming even more micro and starting to uh, really diversify how that facade might look using twigs or something even smaller from trees as a, as a facade system. Yeah, uh, is this on? Oh, um, just uh, I'll, I'll let Thorson uh, take that one. Um, but I would just say that I think uh, Thorson uh, and the whole team has been talking about what we've forgotten, right, as, as architects and engineers and what we can remember now. And in some ways it's like back to the future. Um, the, the future, in some ways, of manufacturing is not manufacturing. It's growing. It's using our own biological engine. It's using our own planet to kind of produce the things that we need, just like we used to. So in some ways, this is a very old-fashioned idea. Um, there, you will notice one slide had a lot of uh, studies that we did. We've looked at a lot of different vectors. Um, we've sort of automated that with um, some software. Um, but we've only scratched the surface of what that pattern can be and whether it's more interlocking and lacy, um, what its geometries are. Right now we have a sweep from east to north in the facade that opens up lightly because we're omitting a corner column um, and putting that kind of very light uh, lattice of whole wood members to work. Yeah, and uh, maybe as an engineer, I have to say it's not just a facade. I mean, it, this this would work as a lateral bracing component, like a, like a, like triangles, um, uh, and I think that's that's interesting because the we would as I said it would share the responsibility for the lateral bracing system, and how we do that, we we we, we have several pieces, so to say, and so we don't do not just count on one, but uh, if one would fail, but we don't, but we do not expect the, the adjacent one could take over. Yeah, so it's a it's a system which works. Uh, because it's many of them, and they are slightly, let's say, over uh, done, so to say, in number, so that they can take over uh, each other's task. Um, your your question is really a good one, and it goes to the heart of a, of, of a large discussion that we had on our team about finding the right balance between having materials that are market ready and actually can be built, like in, in two years, right in 2023, we want this building to open, um, but at the same time, positioning um, the school um, as a leader in something new, something that's going to be really forward-looking, that's that's a biophilic in nature, and so we, we we conceived of the idea of putting the two systems to work together. Okay, I will say that the presentation or the suggestion that. Uh, sets in motion in my mind an entire discussion, as I said, about the difference between decoration and ornament. Right? What is the actual purposeful use of that? It's not a facade treatment where it is, but it's also very much structural as well. So, yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Please don't be shy. We know you're tired, um, but. No, oh, stimulated, thrilled. Peter, I, I, I just because you talk about that's the different worlds, you know, an engineer, I see this 20% additional strengths not used at the moment. Yeah, and that's, I think it's really, it's the performance. It's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's another discussion, uh, probably another language, so to say. But in my opinion, this is the interesting part engineering wise and, and the higher performance which is possible with these components. Yeah? In the back, yes. What aspect of the project do you as a group feel most passionate about? Getting it built. <laughs> I don't mean to be I don't mean to be flippant, um, but probably that's a 
that's a truthful answer. Um, and and um, it's not just a talk. Um, I think we've tried to um, take a fairly radical idea that would really position the school, um, both in the present, when there are many CLT buildings that are being built, and Katie's map shows that, and, and moving the Timberland Center to really be a kind of beacon for something that could be, in the future, a first time, a first instance, a, a, a real kind of innovation. All that, yes, but at the same time, we've tried to bake in um, a, a pragmatic thinking, um, practicalities that would allow us to realize a building very much like this um, you know, for the schedule and, and for the budget that's been outlined by the dean. I would just add, yeah, I just add to that. The, the, the passion at, at some level really comes from the surplus of relevancy that a project like this has because every time you scale it from, let's say, just going out and doing what Wes is saying, bringing, bagging trees, bringing them in and looking at them uh, in terms of their cellulose, in terms of bacteria, what's affecting them, all the way to the kind of possibility that Arkansas beco becomes the sort of new Northwest, it, it has an economic bearing on this. So it's, it, as architects, there's nothing more thrilling than doing something that matters. And this project matters because it, it can affect so many people at so many left levels in so many disciplines. And that's really what architecture needs to be about. It's working at all those scales and affecting as many people as possible, but doing it in the right way and in a responsible way. I don't know, do I have a microphone? The microphone is on, thank you. I think you said it yourself that if the 20th century was the century of, of steel, that the thought that the 21st century would be the century of timber construction is incredibly exciting. Um, and it, it solves a lot of problems that perplex all of us now in terms of housing or in terms of carbon, or in terms of industry and economic development. I can't really think of a more exciting project type. So um, it was a thrill to be asked to be on this team, really. Um, so I think that what you're all doing is not only important pedagogically, but I think it's really going to be a contributor to what will ultimately be a change in the way buildings are built and delivered. Justin Tucker. I'm Justin, I'm with the fabrication team with the school, and I got a practical question. If you could describe to me like the big material handling, the gantry crane, and the ceiling height spaces in the main fabrication area. Kind of give me an idea of, of big material handling and how it would go down from from truck to back out again. And then I'm really curious about the moving constructions on the third floor thing, because in, in a quick view of the plan, I didn't really see how that happened either. Let, let me try to answer that one first. Um, we've uh, used, uh, we're proposing the use of a single elevator. Are you, did you talk about elevators with all the other, um, all the other uh, competitors? I don't know, maybe we're getting too far into the weeds, but um, I thank you for your question. Um, we are, are proposing a large freight elevator um, and um, the, uh, the roof of the auditorium is strategic. Um, MLK Boulevard right now today is a, is a fast street with, which is primarily vehicular and the cars go by pretty quickly. So you want a high reader there. You want an object that's fairly large that can speak to the work that is being done in the school right on top of that roof, something that can be in the, on the exterior, just like if, 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 if we hearken back to the last century, the way an automobile might be placed you know, in an automobile dealership. But this is the 21st century now, and it's the century of wood. So that could be a tiny house. That could be uh, a, an element that's assembled, taken up in the freight elevator. There are large doors, move out and assemble it there. So I think that that does cover it. There's a long, slow ramp that moves from the workshop up three feet to the lobby um, and entryway so that that lobby can be an active lobby where um, building, a certain amount of building and manufacturing can still happen. Um, and your question about the gantry, it was really important to us to have continuous gantry coverage. 
Um, we benchmarked, we know a lot of these uh, buildings firsthand, but we benchmarked the ETH's uh, labs where they have a long gantry and they have their robots mounted on the gantry. And usually the Swiss get it right, but in this case there's a lot of vibration and actually my colleagues who work in that building say it's very difficult to get accuracy because of that. So any of your automated cells want to be on the slab and you want to have your gantry moving only when it's moving materials. So we have the gantry as high as possible and we're imagining that dust collection can happen along the perimeter in a loop system. And that means that there will be equipment in the center of the floor that will have dust collection moving over to the side, which does mean that large objects need to be lifted above that and carried along the length. And we do think we have the height. Uh, don't take my word for it, just look at the section on the board. Um, I think there is a dimension on it, um, and I believe it's uh, 34 feet to the roof, correct, Ron? To the roof, yeah. yeah the, mm -hmm. the, gantry is 20, the, the gantry is 20 foot clear. Yeah. I mean, it was really interesting looking at typologies of workspaces. And the, the deceiving thing is that when you just look at plans, they're sort of scaleless. I mean, the, the Spokane Valley plant is enormous. You know, a lot of these you know, Canadian plans are 30, 40,000 square foot easily, but what we, when we're talking here, something that's going to be more in the, in the range of like 12,000, let's say, for just that workspace for the wood. So you need to go to kind of that medium size, let's say Brechtstoppel. Brechtstoppel is the heavy term, timber version that's going on in Austria and Germany, which is what our soft house was made of. And when we, were, when we went to the, the factory there, it was interesting because they are very linear. And, 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 and our site is not linear. I mean, it's kind of more square in proportion. So the breakthrough was the ability when we got the advisory that you could go you know, past the uh, no build line and be able to actually provide that kind of space that would allow for the flexibility of a gantry grain that touches every square inch of that space so that 20 years from now, if you decide to deliver, deliver off the west instead of the east, just because you know, your equipment changes, your needs changing, um, you can do that. So that was a breakthrough. So um, long story short, um, you can drop materials off on government in a 40-foot uh, truck. Um, you can um, come around later when things are ready to the west end and pick them up. And you can also drive along the, the street that we sometimes call a plaza. It's, it's a, a drivable surface that is a per permeable grasscrete. Um, that, that Wes described in his landscape design. So there are both end uh, loading and unloading possibilities, and there are three large doors along the service road that would also allow for material to go back and forth. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Other questions? Uh, one more from the back. talked about that when we were building the model. Um. It's certainly something that has to do with the budget. I mean, we can have trees transplanted into sites up to, say, 25 feet, 30 feet tall. So we're doing that right now in a very urban spot in, right in front of the convention center in New Orleans. 30 foot, 35 foot live oaks are going in you know, along a street in a park, basically a big linear park. What we would probably do is mix that in. So some large trees that would come in to start to give structure to that site, that start to give it you know, a bigger presence, maybe there's three or four or five of those, along with some smaller trees that start to grow up. The other thing we want to do is have trees of different age in the landscape itself. We don't want them all to grow up at the same time and then all be the same height and maturity. So we want to go ahead and build in this idea of a, of a you know, multi-age uh, canopy and, and tree structure there. Um, so, yes, some of these would be big, 
and some of them would start to grow. That'd be something we start to look at in combination with both the, the landscape design and the budget and, and logistics and things like that. Yep. Yeah, I think you, you showed that diversity of size, I think, in, in the images. One comment that I'd like to make, I'm really impressed uh, with the, the strength of your part team, uh, conceptually as well as urbanistic. Uh, fabulous part team. Maybe not quite a follow-on to the question about the mature tree or younger tree or size, but Wes, you indicated the, an, an interest, an ambition to take the landscape down to the scale of the blossom almost, mm -hmm. yeah, that there's a, something very tactile and at the scale of the hand available to people as they are in that landscape. From the building perspective, what would be the in a way, the equivalent to that scale of the hand, that tactility that either you've thought about or maybe has been in the, the, the designs and we just haven't picked up on? Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good question. I think um, the large perspective of the workshop begins to get at that, that one would enter into a very, a very tall, vast space but it's, it's uh, shallow and it runs deep east-west um, on that industrial grid. And so you would approach um, a tall window running down most of the length of the north side of that shop. And the way that the beam is stepping back means that you're actually maximizing the north light that's coming in. And that window is sizable. Um, and there, as you approach that, you would find um, a, a wall about uh, five feet in front of you, which would have your clamps, your tools on it, and your desk. So I think that what humanizes the shop is the um, hand tools, the, hand, the smaller machines, and so forth, that would be along that wall that you would see, recognize, and gravitate to. Um, in the lobby, we probably looked at a scaling device, which was sort of beginning to kind of extrude out of the stairs um, uh, um, portions of wood um, which could cantilever a little bit off the stair. They're very, very easy to do that. That would be pedestals for all sorts of uh, objects and products. And then we imagined how those could be set free, so to speak, come off the stairs and be rolled around and be something that would be um, both bench that you could sit on, human scale, podium, um, be able to move upstairs via the freight elevator, be able to move down into the shop as necessary. So we're thinking about, you know, we haven't really delved um, into the interiors in great depth because this is a competition, but we're, we're thinking about those kind of touch points. Um. I mean, I, I'm not suggesting there's an absence of this that, um, to my perception, the routed plywood panels have that degree of desired tactility, or in fact, you're attempting to make those desirable for, for touching. Well, it's, it's really been the opportunity to work on an, an idea about structure that's led to these thoughts about um, stepping, making the most efficient glue lamb uh, uh, waffle slabs. So the stepping back is, is, is that kind of tactility, although you might not be able to touch it. Sometimes you don't need to touch something to feel its tactility. Uh, because it's there. So the ability for a structure to kind of morph into almost like furniture-like detail uh, would be, I think, something would be really interesting to pursue on this project. I'm going to perhaps bring us to a close and, and pose a question for, the, for really for everyone, but <laughs> which is to say that at one point as we were discussing uh, interview processes and and so forth that we, uh, also in the competition brief, that potentially a request to each team would be to design the door handle of such a building, what that might look like. So I pose that as an open-ended proposition to everyone in the audience, and it's an open-ended proposition to you, but to what is that tactile aspect there um, that would, in a way, almost be representative of your ambitions? I could answer that. But. <laughs> I think it's actually going to be something pretty close to our, our project logo, most likely. I think you're going to have a handshake with a tree, <laughs> and you're going to understand the relationship of that tree that, uh, that just fits your hand and a piece of more uh, um, industrially extruded, milled CLT. 
knowing that you just came back from Finland, I'm not surprised. So, uh, I will bring this to a close now and um, think of that as perhaps a summary conclusion from your perspective. Um, as we've discussed earlier, we have um, many, many things to continue to think about. You've added to this immensely uh, stimulated and provoked our thinking with your work on display and now with your presentation here. Uh, on behalf of the project and the school, the university, I want to thank you very much and thank the whole team back there in Boston and really across the world, even in Seattle, uh, uh, we could say, but uh, we're very grateful and very appreciative and we wish you well and uh, thank you very, very much. <laughs>